sorry we ran a bit tight on time, but must give Ronan Kennedy, also my colleague from Manuel Galway, due time on a topic that I think might complement and dovetail well with your presentation, except there's more human effort, I think, involved in Ronan's. Ronan's got a lot of experience over a period of time in analysing the kind of issues that are reported to us by users of online information resources. So can we hand over to you, Ronan? Thanks, John. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. We're in the home stretch now, so nearly there. I can always smell the coffee. I'm going to just set my timer here because I suddenly have had a, an irrational fear of red lights flashing in my <laughs> life. <laughs> so anyway, we'll get going. So I'm going to talk to you today about just the development of an e-resource reporting form that we have in place in NUI Galway and the analysis of the results that we've got back from, from users in terms of what they submit. So we'll start with the, the standard background slide. So uh, if we consider the library as a kind of a broadcaster receiver model, obviously we're set up to be primarily built as broadcasters. We arrange our information, we categorize it, we organize it, and we kind of let it out there for the user community. We, we tend to kind of push a lot of information out there. And our focus, quite rightly, is on being broadcasters, but not necessarily as receivers of information. So from time to time when the problems do arrive, how do we set ourselves up to be clear receivers of information? And up to a few years ago, for us in e-resources and journals, we weren't actually set up like that. So that meant that when we did receive information or signals, so to speak, they were full of noise because they were being reported into various different places. And when they finally did come back to us, they were losing some of their, their sort of contextual meaning, which made it a little bit more difficult for us then to figure out what was going on. So somebody coming up and saying, you know, people are having problems accessing resources from off campus. It's a bit frustrating, I guess, in one way, because now we're suddenly alerted to the fact that there's a problem, but we don't have enough information to try and figure out that problem. And we do finally kind of engage in dialogue with the user. There's a lot of back and forth to try and figure out the problem. So we decided, let's be good. Let's be clear receivers of the information here and try and get the job done in one go and kind of keep user satisfaction fairly high. So we decided to establish a contact form for users that had to be convenient, quick, and easy to discover, and would probably reflect a lot of the points that Michelle was making there earlier on, especially in terms of speed. So we set up with some design principles for the form, and a lot of these are fairly kind of pragmatic, fairly kind of common sense, really, one that have to be easy to find, well marketed, a good standard of service. The two key ones are the ones at the bottom here, the last two, it had to be quick to fill out by the user, for all the reasons that Michelle was just saying there a little while ago, to kind of keep them engaged. But at the same time, it had to provide a lot of information and context, context for us to be able to solve the problem. So the goal for us was that if somebody reported a, a problem with accessing a resource, that in their one initial contact, we'd have everything we need to be able to solve the problem for them and we'd have the case complete. We don't really like back and forth traffic. It's our, our ideal world scenario is we receive the information, we solve the problem, and everybody goes. But trying to match the two of those is sort of like an irresistible force and a, an immovable object. You have to try and kind of find some sort of a fine balance somewhere. So this is the form we came up with, and I'm not going to go into it for too much detail, but I just want to point out things. Obviously, there's a lot of fields here, uh, and they're all here for a reason. Uh, a few of the fields are mandatory and a few of them aren't. So ones like the user ID obviously is mandatory. We also put in an email which is mandatory as well. So even though users, we could probably find out what their NUI Galway email address is by looking up the user ID. A lot of users like to use happydude at gmail.com or whatever it is. And we wanted to use the email address that they wanted most of all. And then we have a couple of other things. You can't really see them too well there, but this is just indicative. So another mandatory one, it was a radio button there, was where are you on campus or off campus? And this is geared for us. So straight away, Making this mandatory means that if somebody's reporting that they were off campus when trying to access resources, we can sort of make a few logical conclusions here that it's something to do with the fact that they haven't signed in properly. Or we're starting to kind of create a framework, I suppose, of the user. We're starting to assemble some of the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And some of the other options that are in there are drop-down options. And they're things like, you know, what, what service were you using uh, when you encountered the problem? And we've pre-filled in there SFX, or link was over, Google Scholar, the library catalog, kind of standard things like that. But the point about this is that having them available to kind of just choose as a drop-down form increases the speed for the user submission, which makes them more likely to continue to submit the form. But it's also given us a lot of really good key information. So when it is time to investigate what the problem is, we've built up enough of a sort of a character profile of the user to try and figure out where the problem is. Okay? So if we go back to our design principles here, it had to be easy to find by the user. So what did we do to try and kind of tick these boxes? So the link is embedded in our uh, SFX form, which is our link resolver form. So every time the SFX menu comes up, there's a link at the bottom of it to report a problem. So if a user sees something that they're not too happy with in SFX, they have the instant link there. We also have it located on the website in the standard sort of contact us place. If you do a search for e-resource or inquiry, it's the first thing that comes up, things like that. It had to be quick to fill out by the user. So that's why we had all those radio buttons and drop down this, and that was quite important. To fill out the form from start to finish will usually take less than a minute. 
And that is far quicker than somebody actually submitting something in an open form. So if we had a web page and said, what's your email address? And a big text box and said, just describe exactly what the problem is. It's human nature. I think we all tend to get a little bit more verbose when we're filling things out in open text. And I was perusing the catalog, and I was trying to find a collection for this, that, and the other. And I think we kind of do it because we don't want to seem impolite by just firing in like blunt words. Whereas having the form already kind of pre-filling out a lot of the words, the users are far more inclined to do it. They don't have to do that much typing. They know it's just less than a minute, and that means that we're reducing the obstacle of a, an unwieldy form for the user to use before they can actually get in contact with us. So it had to provide the information and context for us at the same time. So things like where you're on campus or off campus, what systems were being used, things like that that help us already draw some conclusions about the user's journey and where we can go to try and solve the problem for them. So it had to be well marketed. Uh, hats off to the subject librarian team there. And it's always mentioned um, for part of training sessions, induction sessions, and things like that. Anywhere where we think we're going to encounter users who are going to have problems or might have problems in the future, we always refer them to the forum here like that. So that's, that's very, very good for us. So it had to have an intelligent process in the background as well, and that was key for us to be able to do a kind of a speedy resolution of problems. So what we've done is the form is set up to report to once the user hits submit, it submits to a hidden email address. And that hidden email address creates a ticket in our ca campus service desk ticketing system. So once they've done that, it goes into a ticket into our resources group, and we have a team of people who are working, and there's a team of people on a rota, on a rota every day. So that means that while I'm standing up here droning on to you guys, there's not a bunch of e-resource forms coming into my email box. Whoever's on duty in the day gets it, which means there's always going to be what we aim for is a quick turnaround going on there as well, okay? So that's the intelligent process there. And a high standard of service, standard things, try and get back to them very quickly. Even if somebody's looking for something we don't have, we try not to end with no. We always try to refer somebody on to ILLs, whatever else it is that we have as well. Okay, so in behind the scenes, it's all working away very well. Users are using it. We get lots of, sort of returning customers, so to speak. But we also have an opportunity to mine a lot of data in the background. So we have two and a half years of these tickets coming in. So what we decided to do was take a look at all these tickets coming in and see if we can build a profile of, of the users on a per month basis and just try and get a better idea of what's going on. So you can see there the blue spike in September, October there for 2014. There was a big ferry of tickets coming in there. Obviously got a little bit worried about that when we realized that a lot of library staff use the form as well. And if they're doing, say, checks of holdings for their subjects or something like that, if they find problems, they'll submit in the form with us and it helps us to fix them up fairly quickly. So what we're able to do then is every single ticket that's come into us, we're able to assign it one of nine categories and that's just the nine categories there. And that's very handy for us because we can get a good picture of where users are encountering their problems, okay? So things like Aleph, you know, might be a problem in the holdings record, it might be in a little bit inaccurate, or there might be duplicate records or something like that. Uh, miscellaneous ones, which is actually, I thought 98% of our tickets were going to be miscellaneous, they're real random things like there might be a problem with the campus account authentication system or some sort of server site, server security uh, certificate details or something like that. Primo is uh, our discovery layer system if the problem is lying there. Uh, a resource issue if Science Direct is down or something like that, and that causes a flurry of tickets that will be assigned there. SFX, it's just that we have to change some holdings information. Technical issues outside our range happen occasionally. There's not really much we can do. It's outside our range, so to speak. So an example of that one would be uh, somebody wasn't able to access full text of a resource because their antivirus software was blocking the, the full text access. So we do try and help them. And then the last one then is user error, where all the information that we have in the, in the holdings or in all our records is, is correct, but the user still assumes that you know, they're looking for something that is very, very clear we don't have, looking for 1975 access to a journal that we only have access to from 1995. So taking a look at those nine categories, seeing how they broke down for 2014, and this is what we got, somewhat surprisingly. So we'll start in third place. I don't know if they're the winners or the losers. I don't know what way to, to call it. Like, uh, resources subscription issues in third place there. A lot of those came up actually directly off the back of sweats going under. And obviously, the, 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 the administration problems that we had with our subscriptions off the back of that one. Aleph, there was a fair few problems there. It's a drop from the previous year. But that is really good fuel for us because now we started this drive towards everything that we do, we try and build in, making sure that the holdings records in Aleph are accurate. We've even started some journal holdings updates projects with a view to try and bring that number down, and we know now that it's needed. So that's really, really good. It's given us really good sort of empirical evidence to be able to kind of start, target our resources in certain areas. And then the user error one, unfortunately, is a, is a sort of an unfinished chapter, I guess. Um, are 21% of our users stupid? I, I don't know. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, actually, because we've been live streamed. 
<laughs> but we can see here, there's, there's a lot of information now that we can try and sort of investigate. And, and this is where we're going. Uh, at the moment, I think our focus is really more on sort of building the character profiles, and then we'll try and get to the reasons. So if we take a look at the user error one for 2014, you can see there are spikes at three times in the year. Now, you might remember there the, a few slides ago, the, the overall ticket submission spikes tended to be in September, October, and this one here, it's sort of November, December, spiking up in February, March, and again in June. So we have to get to the bottom of this. A hypothetical theory that I have is that we have people coming in, term starts in September, they're working away, suddenly projects or assignments are due, they suddenly have to start using our resources, realize they don't know what they're doing, and start hitting these spikes. So it'll be the same for then, same for exam time in the summer, and also again for the poor sods in June who are repeating and, and hitting the same problems again. So we've assembled lots of graphs to try and build lots of pictures for all of the nine different factors here. It's actually been very, very useful, very, very insightful. One of the things we can do, this is the last slide, so don't worry, coffee's coming. Uh, this is the last slide here. We were able to use the, say, this example here, we were able to focus our resources over the last year and really trying to get all the holdings information in SFX correct. And now we can see the difference between 2013 and 2014 is having a positive effect. So we know now we didn't waste our time and we didn't waste our resources. All of the facets going in behind the user resource inquiry form have been really, really useful for building these things. So the examples I have today are just snapshots of sort of an indicative pattern, but it's actually been very, very useful. So that's it. Enjoy your coffee. Thank you.